ServiceNow Knowledge Store team is sponsored by ServiceNow. Here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Jeff Frick. We're back. Sheila Jordan is here. She's the CIO of Symantec. We're live. This is theCUBE. We're at ServiceNow Knowledge 14 at Moscone in San Francisco. We're going to be here uh, today, uh, Wednesday, and most of Thursday. So stop by if you're at Moscone. Moscone South, come in, look to the right. The Cube is there. Stop by and say hello. Sheila, welcome to the Cube. Thank you very much. Excited to be here. Yeah, so you were across the street, I guess, at uh, the CIO event, right? Yes. What, what's, what's the vibe like over there? Describe it. Well, I would say there's probably about 300 or so CIOs, and it really is fascinating because everyone's kind of discovering how important the cloud's becoming and how relevant the cloud's becoming in the in the CIO world. It was, you know, years ago it was more about if the cloud's coming and now it's here, and it's a question of, CIOs are struggling with or answering the question is how does this really integrate with kind of on-prem solutions, so really it's making the cloud more and more real. You know, it's interesting, five years ago, if I asked a CIO about the cloud, you know, they would say, hey, it's another quiver in the, another arrow in the quiver, and you know, we're looking at it, et cetera, et cetera. Some might say, hey, we're not using the cloud, especially in financial services. But IT practitioners right. would roll their eyes. Oh, the <laughs> cloud, yeah, the cloud, it's IT. What do you mean the cloud, the cloud, the cloud? That seems to have yes. changed. Yes. Uh, and and it, uh, uh, the, the practitioner base is, is more accepting yes. of that notion of the cloud. What's changed? Well, I would say a couple things. One is I think the when we used to kind of roll our eyes, we were very concerned about the security of the cloud, for sure. And I think with the cloud providers, we've seen lots of improvements in the security angle. The other thing I'll tell you is in IT, we constantly get the pressure of delivering things faster and cheaper, and the cloud offers us that solution to be able to deliver things faster and cheaper, whether that's you know, for your HR systems or whether that's for some of the other solutions. So the promise is real, and we're beginning to see that, and I think they're really shoring up the security aspects of the cloud as well. How, how does it change your role? I mean, what are the changes that are sort of required from okay. CIO's perspective? Yeah, I will say that I think that the CIO today is really focused on five big things. Mobile cloud, structured and unstructured data, so the whole data play, as well as you know, kind of your personal and professional identity, and then of course the final one is the internet of everything. So more devices coming into the enterprise. And I really think the thing that flows through those five things is two things. One is the data that flows through that. So whether the data is sourced from the cloud or on-prem, the end user wants to have that similar experience whether where the data is sourced from. And the second component is, of course, you know, how we secure that. You know, the whole notion of security is becoming more and more critical that you know, securing things at the network layer is good, but in the device is good, but now we're being asked to really make sure that we're securing things across the entire enterprise stack while everything's changing. The devices are changing, the, the sourcing is changing, as well as you know, now the new devices with the internet of things. We do a lot of big data shows, and <laughs> everybody talks about the you know, data is the new oil, and yeah. you know, the data-centric organization. Um, how real is that at, at Symantec? I mean, you've only been there three months, I know, right. but, but you know, based on your observations, uh, um, just it's semantic, but generally right. in your IT, uh, IT community, how real is that? I think it's very real. In fact, I would say that the job of the CIO is to protect the company's assets and to protect the data. And that's assumed, that the employees assume that the CIO is going to do that. It's certainly become a bit more difficult given cyber criminals are getting smarter and there's more hackers and more, more ways to hack. And of course the device is coming in, but I still think that the role of the CIO has to be to protect the company's assets. There's an interesting discussion we have. We, we actually do a conference, a chief data officer conference with MIT in July. And the, the premise that MIT has put forth is that the chief data officer is a new role in the organization, should be independent of the CIO, should be a peer of the CIO, and have ownership over you know, a lot of different sort of data assets, the data taxonomy, data sources. It's, it's still fuzzy where the lines are done. When you talk to a lot of the big data practitioners, um, they say no way, that's the CIO's job. Um, have you thought about that much in terms of, do you need a data czar? Is, are you the data czar? Yeah, I actually think, you could, but it especially I think it depends on certain industries would make that more, more realistic Healthcare, than others. Healthcare, financial yeah, yeah. services, the regular But I actually stuff. think the chief information officer has information and data already, and I think that's a big part of our role. So whether it's a separate role or not, the coordination and the combination and, and the reliance on each role is really critical. So don't you have enough to do? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> well, now they want you to innovate, right? Now yes, they want you to be a force of innovation, they want you to be a business partner, a value creator outside of just the asset. So how is that all playing well, within and your uh, And that's why I guess it's so fun. I've always said that being in IT, you got to like change. And being in IT for an IT company, you really got to like change. 
And I would say that it is what's exciting about the CIO role is yes, I categorize it simplistically, but it's around run the business, change the business, and grow the business. And if historically it might have been that CIOs were just about run the business, not anymore. The CEOs are expecting us to run, change, and grow, and we got to find solutions and technology cost effectively of how we can do that. And now you've got all these mega trends hitting you uh, like a ton of bricks, like you said, the cloud, mobile, social. Yeah. How has that kind of changed the game in the last couple of years? Well, I think it's, it's uh, both exciting and daunting at the same time. I think it's exciting because it does open things up. And again, most of our employees, or also all of our employees, are consumers. So they're having this consumer-like experience, and they want to come into IT, and they want to come to work, and have the same kind of experience. So I think it opens up a whole new way for us to deliver services. And one of the things we're working on in Semantic IT is to create a services-led organization where we actually are delivering services. So your email services, your content service, your video service, your pricing service, so that we can really deliver these services in a way that you have consumed those services as a consumer. So it used to be, I mean, still is, most IT shops talk about systems. Right. You know, insurance company, my claim system. You know, that's where my investment is going. It's this big silo infrastructure built around it. Do you see that changing, where we're, are, the parlance even changes to, yeah. these are my services, this is my service catalog, yes. this is how I'm charging for that? Yes, yes I do, um, pretty, subst pretty substantially, and we're implementing that kind of services-led mentality at Semantic now, and the reason is because the system and the applications is, at some level, kind of irrelevant. You know, you're going to replace systems and applications, but ultimately you don't want to replace the service. The customer, our employees want to get used to having that video service, they really don't care anymore where it's sourced from, on-prem in the cloud, and they don't necessarily care about what technology was used to get there. They want their service. So I think as an IT organization, one, by creating the services-led um, organization, you are really clear about how you're spending the IT dollars and really clear about how the transparency of the cost of those services, and then really clear to your point, you know, I love to shop on the, on the internet as a consumer, and I'm so used to picking and clicking, right? And so we want to deliver services that simply to the organization that people understand the service and the cost of those services. So, did you, let's see, <laughs> I, I love the whole concept of portfolio management, the application portfolio, run the business, grow the business, transform the business, the old meta group, <laughs> you know, taxonomy, I love that. And I, and, and I could see, I used to work with CIOs all the time and they would actually use that and say, okay, we're just going to subjectively say, here's my run the business apps, here's my grow the business, grow the business here's a transform the business. We're going to allocate the portfolio accordingly. Do you look at your services catalog the same way? And how does it, how, where would you like to see it? it yeah. It's very difficult to get out of that 70-30, yes. you know? Yes. Um, because by definition, you're yes. always running. Yes. You know? yes. So, but how do you look at that, that mix? And, and how do you, what's your ideal mix? Well, it's very difficult because you do have to do kind of portfolio planning, but I do think with cloud solutions, it offers us, offers us a different solution to be more cost effective and agile. So clearly, you're going to have someone run the business, but I'm not necessarily spending a lot of money on the actual infrastructure to take some of the on-prem solutions that we used to do. So the cost will be, total cost of ownership should be less with some of the cloud services. That's the promise. So when I think about run, grow, change, I know other sources like Gartner and Forrester will say that a large enterprise company spends 65 to 70% on run the business still, even though we've made all these advancements. We have an aspirational goal at Semantic IT. I'm not sure we can get there, because again, it feeds. But if we could get to a point that we are really a third, a third, a third, wouldn't it be cool if IT could deliver two thirds of the IT spend on change and grow versus run? So it's aspirational, and I'm not giving you that. But, that's but you know what, too, maybe, yeah. maybe we're thinking about it the wrong way, because maybe that's an impossible equation to solve. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should be looking, I wonder if it get your feedback on this. It just struck me. Maybe we should think about it like, almost like product cycles. I remember you know, one of the CEOs around here, we used to be very proud of the fact that he was in a product cycle intensive business, said 70% of the products that we have, you know, on the 70% the, the of our revenue is coming from products that we've announced in the last 12 months. Maybe that's how we should be looking at it. Because by definition, they're going to be more modern, more innovative, and with the services, catalog approach, you, you may be able to do that. These are the services that we've launched in the last X number of months. We can look at consumption. Do you think that's a, a, a reasonable I way think to it's look a, at it? an actually interesting way to look at it. And I would say that with some of the things that ServiceNow is actually introducing, you know, one of the things we want in IT is just visibility. What services are being used? If I had to rank them and rate them, ranking and rating, are they four stars, five stars? I mean, we want that visibility across the organization and delete, delete, delete the things that aren't effective and that aren't working. Sometimes in IT, we don't know that or see that. So one of the things I think it's really important is with ServiceNow or any of the other solutions is that 
when we get that visibility, we can go back and say to the organization, look, four people are using the service. You know, it's no longer effective as it used to be. Let's delete it. And again, that feeds into that cost savings will feed into run the business and grow and change. GRS, getting rid of stuff. We <laughs> yeah. never get rid of stuff. <laughs> I know. Here. And I really, that's my goal, is that we have to delete, delete, delete. Yeah. Well, Sheila, it's interesting that you put a different twist on, we hear a lot about now the app is king, right? Everyone is about the app, the app, the app, line of business wants to build your own app, but you're really putting the, ser delivering the app as a service above the actual application. And, and knocking down the value of the particular app that delivers that service. Yeah, and I am, for a couple reasons. First of all, not necessarily on a mobile device. You're going to need your apps. We're all addicted to our certain apps, for sure. But the reason why I think about that in the, in the enterprise is because a service is going to be ultimately comprised of the technology, process, and culture, and people, right? So an app, in my mind, still gets us to just the technology, when in reality, to make these services real, and continue to optimize the services, you're gonna need the service owner, you're gonna need people and process to really optimize that service. Yeah, so it's the Uber structure. Right, above the app yeah. to deliver the real value. Yes, yes, and that's a really good point. I think in the past, IT's always, and we always will be, held a total cost of ownership. It's really, really, really critical that we show and be fully transparent of our cost. But I actually think with the new technology that's available and we're being expected by our CEOs is we have to deliver value as much as cost value at a reduced cost or, or an improved cost, but I think the, the conversation needs to continue to push what's the value the technology can deliver, not only the cost side. Right. And that's happening. Right. We heard um, earlier today, I don't know if you saw Frank's keynote, but he was talking about how you had, you know, sort of the traditional days, you got application group, you got infrastructure group, infrastructure does operations, they, you know, they, they, they take the code and they make it, <laughs> you know, they deploy it, the application guys, you know, we all know the story. And, right. you know, and now you're seeing the DevOps culture, you're seeing right. programmable infrastructure. Is that happening in, in your organization? Do you see those so, sort of two worlds either fusing or morphing into the business and, and, and becoming a DevOps culture? In pockets. So I would say where we have those labs or where we have proof of concepts in pockets, yes. Has it been pervasively uh, changed in the IT organization? Not quite yet. And I think a couple things. One is we're in some ways just learning about kind of infrastructure as a service and how I can actually you know, push up a server in 15 seconds or less type thing and provision that server in 15 seconds. So we're learning as an organization the whole some organizations are, are certainly better at it than others, but we're learning on the whole infrastructure as a service, we're learning how we can deliver the applications as a service. So I think the next, nat and so we're using agile development and things and scrums and things like that. But I think the next natural evolution is DevOps. Now I would say that you gotta be kind of careful in where you play and push that, because it's a whole new learning, you gotta make sure the people, the talent you have can really, skills, yeah, yeah, so. skills and talents. But I do think it's the next the next area of focus. So we'll pick up on infrastructure as a service. I mean, obviously you got the gold standard of, of Amazon. You look right. at Amazon and go, wow, that's right. pretty impressive what they've done. Um, do you look at that and say, okay, there's a big chunk, stuff on the margins, uh, development, that we should just put into that cloud? Or do you say, why don't we duplicate that, replicate that in-house? Which approach do you think your organization? Well, for a whole host of reasons we're doing private cloud, you know, again, I want to be the biggest proof point of Semantics products that I possibly can, so that means I have to be customer one to our Semantic products and test them out and make sure that we're giving the feedback back to the Semantic group. So we're building our private cloud in, inside Semantic right now, which really will become that infrastructure as a service, uh, using the latest and greatest technology, software-defined networks, et cetera, that we're really putting together the whole stack that allows us to do that. And I, I will tell you that, the, the, where we are today versus what the vision is, it will actually leapfrog the foundation of what we're able to do at the company. Okay, so so you want to essentially duplicate that and leapfrog yes, yes. what you know the public cloud guys are doing. That's in a very secured environment. Pressure's on. Yes. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no Believe path. me, I know. Well, and time is in the, the clock. Is yeah, yeah, yeah. And the clock is clicking. So uh, <laughs> now, now does that change? We were talking about skill sets before. Does that change the type of people you need yes. to bring in? Do you have to hire more PhDs? Yes. You know, I mean, what is well, it's not necessarily the PhDs. It's the real technical talent that know this new space. Yeah. So again, we had done a, a several a years, um, Symantec has outsourced their IT organization, and as we bring that in, we got to make sure and bring in the right skills that supports the new technology. So outsour yeah, outsourcing was, ended up being, you know, sort of my mess for less, and then it ended up not being less, and so yeah, a lot of guys have brought yeah. that back in. But, but okay, so you sort of replicate and try to, try to, try to leapfrog that capability. Do you become a, a profit center? Oh, I think it's dangerous. I think it's a real slippery slope if IT becomes a profit center. And the reason I say that is because I think our focus and our number one job is to really deliver 
an optimal, excellent experience for our employees, while providing, again, being in IT for an IT company, I think we're, our job is to make sure we're delivering the best experience we can while showcasing our products internally and testing and using them. The second you have another motive or another driver, I think it takes the eye off the ball. So, so I, I kind of agree with you. I mean, I do and I don't. On the one hand, if you were to sell your IT services externally, then I, oh, I, I, full I, game I, on that. I, I would disagree, <laughs> yes, right. Yes, but, yes. but because you've got a captive right, audience, right, right. You, you're saying you would, you, you basically, monopolistic right, power, you right. know, and monop you'd be corrupt like all monopolies. So. And we can certainly <laughs> come up with what I've pushed, what I've suggested to my team is, we can come up with a whole bunch of ideas of how to improve the product, or maybe there's a gap in our product strategy that we can suggest to the business unit. So I think in that case, as we come up with, I mean, we are the number one customer of our products. So if we have ways to enhance it before the product goes to market or opens up another opportunity, our, our business unit leaders are really open to that. Now what about chargebacks? Okay, so you're not going profit center. What about chargebacks? You know, another thing that I think is a pretty slippery slope, um, you know, cross-charging chargebacks, it's a co complex overhead that if you're one company, why do you add that level? I'm, I'm a real simple person. I always person. ask. I'm a real simple person and I just like simple and easy and someone hold accountable and. Companies don't do it. They, I mean, 15% of companies will do chargebacks yeah. and it's sort of you know, stuck there. It's a this lot is the of reason overhead. Why. It's, it's a lot like, of overhead. Why it's bother, a lot, right? yeah, yeah. 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 And I'd rather drive accountability into the person that's delivering the service has accountability to do that as cost effectively as possible. So Sheila, and the five things you mentioned, one of them was your, was it your personality? Well, it was, it was a personal thing. No, it's you went through it very quickly. Oh, I'm sorry. So the five big trends that I see happening from an IT, uh, from a trending perspective in the IT industry that CIOs are really going to need to be thinking about, right. and they have already, so this right. really isn't new, but I do think the five together is pretty powerful. It's of course mobility. Right. Um, it's cloud, all the cloud services. Right. The third is around data, so both right. unstructured and structured data coming together. Right. And of course, I think Nirvana on that one is when unstructured data can be fed into part of the decision making, like structured data is. Right. That's going to be interesting. The fourth is the convergence of personal and professional identities. So people are coming into their organization with their mobile phones, and they want one phone. They okay. want one device. So okay. how does IT professionals and what's the right solution for different industries merge or at least containerize, whichever one you want to do, the personal versus professional identities. <clears throat> and then the last one is, of course, mobility is one thing, but all this explosion of other devices. Yeah, beyond the mobile. Right, and so, and then what glues all that together is data and, of course, security. Right. Secu we have to make sure all that's secured as we traverse all those different trends. <laughs> and, yeah, actually, where, where, do you <laughs> where do you report into the organization? I report to our COO, Stephen Gillette. COO, okay. So, Let's say Steven's doing your performance review. You know, when you came on, he said, okay, these are your objectives. If you, maybe, you know, you guys write it together. What are your objectives, you know, for the next 12 months? What yeah, so it's uh, interesting times, it's semantic, and I would say that we've agreed that it is, and I've been there now 60 days, so what we've agreed is really this insourcing is a pretty big effort and initiative, and especially around how we can stand up our own data center, our own network, all the application migration, it's a pretty big effort. The other part um, I would tell you is pretty important for Symantec right now is the Global Security Office reports to me as well. So understanding the security risks and making sure that we really do uh, have, have um, understood and really being thought leadership in the security space, that's kind of number two. And I would say in general, the overall services led, how we change the structure of the IT organization would be number three. And, and I would imagine you're an early consumer of a lot of the Symantec security products. Yes, so, we are. So you must be a pretty important constituent <laughs> yes, of the product groups that have a lot of <laughs> A lot of juice for those yeah, guys. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, that's part of the job that's really, really fun is when we can actually provide some input and feedback on their products and see it, see it built into the roadmap. It gets quite exciting. So how, how, you know, we heard again Frank this morning saying, look, the CIO's got to know as much about the business as the business people do. That's, that's a tall order, especially in a company the size of, of Symantec. But do you, do you buy that, at least in part? Um, and how do, you, how do you develop that knowledge? Well, I would say that, um, you know, first of all, yes, I buy into it. I really do think, and again, it goes back to being in IT for an IT company, being their customer, you have, a, you have a pretty big seat at the table. And I think it's really important that you're not only giving advice and counsel on, you know, the product strategy and where we think there could be potential gaps and where things could be improved, but you're also having to tell someone, you know what, that the product's old or we don't want to use that anymore or show some of the, some of the um, inefficiencies in the product. So I think one is, being absolutely tied to the product strategy and having a voice in the product strategy is really critical. Um, and again, I think given that you represent the customer base at that table is also quite exciting. Do you go to sales meetings? 
Um, I'm actually, not yet, 60 days, but we actually have our big customer meeting coming up next week, which I'll be attending. Yeah, I mean, that's a yes. great way to learn yes. about the products yes. and yes. the challenges. Yes, yes. all uh, that. But yes. so, and I love talking to the customers. In my previous roles, I, I talked to a lot of the customers uh -huh. a lot. So to talk about the, the evolution of the, of the role of the CIO in the not tech company, mm -hmm. um, and, and the, the change of tech as a competitive differentiator in, uh, you worked at Disney uh, for years before yeah. Cisco, I saw on LinkedIn. So how is that changing? Yeah. Well, I'd say actually it's kind of similar challenges. In being in IT for the um, tech company, you really are kind of tied to the product and being an instrumental influence in the product strategy, that's one. In a non-tech company, you are challenged with this whole notion, well, that's what I get as a consumer. So I still even think in a non-technology -tech company, when they come to work and they have a less technical experience and the, and the user experience is less than the way to get at home, I think consumers in general are just getting smarter and smarter and smarter about, I have that, that email storage, 10x that at home. Right. I have my mobile device that we're, you know, all these things that we're experiencing as consumers is coming into all the industries, and that expectation of I want to work differently is just, I think, in all companies. With no appreciation of what it means in the background. It's even more just the magic, yeah, which yeah. the magic kingdom is appropriate. So, come back to the conversation we were having before, I mean, is the goal to, to really replicate that or just get good enough? You know, I think, you know, Microsoft, they always say software is good enough. <laughs> they, they made a ton of money in the good enough business. Because can you get there? I mean, because you're talking about scale of, of Amazon and Google and Facebook and, and, and Microsoft. So do you have to be just good enough or do you have to be good, as good or better? You said leapfrog before, right. that was, that was well, notable. We're going to leapfrog our data center structure, right. our data center strategy. What I think is, I do think in delivering a certain, I, I have two teenage children in college and uh, they sometimes wonder, you know, why work? Because they've both now been into the enterprise and they can't quite figure out talking to interns at work, they can't quite figure out why they don't have, this is 2021 20, else, they can't quite figure out why the experience isn't the same. And what I've told our, our, my children as well as the intern group, I says, listen, work is a bit more complicated than, face, than pictures and status. Yeah. You know, work really is. And as an IT professional, you have this obligation and responsibility to protect the company's assets. So no, do I ever want to get to a point that it's as easy as Facebook? Do I ever want to get to a point that, you know, pictures and, and Instagram and things like that, it's not practical to put that in the enterprise. Do I want to get to a point that there are applications that they use on a daily basis and we're do, driving a, a, a sales sales forecast and it's really important that timely and decision making of that as an app on their phone? Yes, I do. And it's self-service. Right, self-service and, it's, and all that, it's yeah. mobile. So yeah. yes, I think we have to be really careful and really explicit about what apps are the right apps for work mm -hmm. and what apps are the ones that you know are just too much risk. A lot of that is expectation setting, yeah. communications, and all the stuff that the new CIO has really <laughs> got to be good at. Comes <laughs> in with a head of steam, that's good. That crystal ball, <laughs> you know, we all have that crystal ball. <laughs> all right, Sheila, we've got to leave it there. Thanks very much Thank for coming you. to theCUBE. Thank you very much. Pleasure Thank you meeting very, you. Nice meeting you as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, everybody, keep it right there. We'll be back to wrap up day one from ServiceNow Knowledge. We're live. This is theCUBE, we're right back.